Okie dokie, it seems like the numbers have stabilized and we've got a nice group um, from all over Europe joining us today. Hi everyone, my name is Jessica mecklem kolnich I am Europark's Youth Officer and today we are going to be talking about communicating your youth work. We've got three experts with us today who are going to be sharing about data protection, safeguarding and increasing your visibility. And each one of these speakers will be sharing the basics with us in their presentation and after each speaker there will be a a chance to ask some questions and um, if you have any questions you've already brought with you feel free to write them in the chat already and I will fish them out um, but there will also be chances for you to unmute yourself um, during the Q&A and to ask your questions and to share your experiences with us yourself so we hope that this will be a very fruitful um, discussion and uh, we'd love to you know, hear from all of you um, and be able to answer any questions you might have on the topics while we have the, these three experts with us. And this is really uh, intended to help you all improve the work you do to show the world how amazing it is to work with young people and how important this work is that we're doing. So to start off, uh, I would like to do a quick overview of Europark to those of us joining us from outside of the Europark family. So Europark Federation was started exactly 50 years ago. We're celebrating our 50 year anniversary this year. It is um, an umbrella organization with over 400 members in over 40 countries across Europe. We are mostly made up of protected areas, administrations, um, and also we have some NGOs and other bodies that manage protected areas around Europe. The Europark Federation as an umbrella organization is all about bringing protected area staff together to share their experiences, to learn from one another um, and to support each other as we all have almost the same goal across Europe, which is to protect nature um, and to conserve biodiversity. We run different conferences, different seminars, uh, we do trainings, uh, we showcase case studies on our website, we write policy papers and advocate for what our members want um, at different levels of, of governance. And as you're all here, we also do webinars. So the idea for this webinar really came from the community. There were requests and concerns uh, with mentors that I'd spoken to, uh, which is why we decided to do a webinar on the subject. From the Europark side, this is an overview of the work we do with young people. We have a program for teenagers called Junior Rangers. Every year we do an international Junior Ranger camp. We also have a Youth Plus program for young adults. And we also have a Europark Youth Manifesto, which is a statement of what young people who live in and around protected areas would like uh, for their living conditions. We also have a Europark Youth Manifesto who sits in our uh, council and, and speaks for the voice of young people. And in the future, we are currently planning to launch a Europark Youth Council. If you're in the Europark network, um, do let me know if you would like to receive the mailing list or well, if you'd like to be added to the mailing list for the young uh, the youth program emails just send me an email and i will add yours to the list um, otherwise i hope you're all already receiving those i also just wanted to give you a brief overview of the europark youth manifesto this is all about empowering young people to advocate for the things they need to live learn and work in communities around protected areas. And it's a call for action for protected areas as well to help facilitate and to provide space to empower these young people so that they can really stand up for what they need. This has resulted in youth committees, youth advisory boards and youth board representatives in protected areas across Europe. So we also can be found on social media. We have the Junior Ranger Facebook pages. Uh, we also have um, the Youth Plus Instagram. So feel free to follow those. So that's all from my side. Yes, so um, today we will be hearing from three experts, as I mentioned. 
Uh, first up, we've got Ilaria Pizzini. Uh, she's an expert from Italy. She has worked with uh, data protection and is intimately familiar with the EU general data protection regulations. And these are also quite similar, I've heard, to those in the UK and to countries outside of the EU. So if you have any questions, do feel free to add them in the chat and maybe other colleagues uh, can share their expertise for outside of the EU. We hope that this will be useful for you. Um, Ilaria, Ilaria will be sharing the basics, as I said, so feel free to get your questions ready and don't be shy because she is really uh, here to share her knowledge and to help all of us. With that, over to you, Ilaria. Feel free to share your screen and to start your presentation. Good afternoon, everybody. And uh, I'm really, really happy to be here. I, I know that data protection is uh, uh, often considered a, a boring argument, but uh, I, I try to, to give you some, uh, uh, to, to share with you some information and I hope it could be useful for you. Uh, of course, uh, um, this, uh, this information about data protection are with a particular reference uh, uh, to kids' data, because I know uh, you have uh, many youth-oriented uh, uh, programs in your parks, in your protected areas, and uh, um, I think uh, it's uh, not always uh, so clear if and uh, how uh, you can post uh, photos, uh, videos, or interviews of something else uh, uh, of your initiatives. So uh, really, I, I hope to help you. And uh, for that, uh, I think we will first see what the rules are, and then uh, what uh, tips and tricks uh, we can uh, you, you we can use okay so uh, let's start um, by recalling the the main regulatory source on data protection that's uh, gdpr i'm sure you know it but it, i'd like to share like uh, a common language okay uh, general data protection regulations since uh, 2018 uh, defines the rules uh, of data protection and covers the processing of, uh, um, of personal data. That is uh, what uh, GDPR uh, defines it in this way. What makes a person identified or identifiable? Okay, so uh, what we are speaking about. We are speaking about uh, the name, of course, and uh, uh, some identification number. You can, you, you can uh, think about uh, your passport number, for example. Uh, location data, that means my, my physical address, but even my, uh, my email address or your email address. Uh, Every, um, every online identifier, for example, your IP address, is considered a personal data. Uh, and then we have really a, a lot of factors uh, uh, regarding uh, physical, physiological, genetic, mental, social, economic, uh, cultural identity of, of, a, of a natural person. And of course, uh, uh, photos and videos. Okay, that's it's look it's like simple, but uh, you, you have to, to remember it always. First of all, uh, speaking about rules, uh, you must remember that one of the most important rules in GDPR uh, concerns uh, um, the obligation, okay? to inform data subjects about the processing of their personal data. Here we can see how important uh, is information in GDPR because the regulation uh, really describes very clearly uh, the way we have to inform data subjects. So uh, it, uh, we, we can read that uh, data, this information must be given in uh, 
uh, transparent, intelligible, easily accessible form using clear and plain language. This is very important, clear and plain, in particular for any information, of course, addressed uh, to, to a child. This information should be provided in writing or by other means. Uh, I, I'm sure you, uh, you know when some uh, uh, someone calls you by phone and uh, tells and asks you, oh, do you want this service? Do you want this product? And you say, okay, uh, I want it. Uh, they inform you recording by phone uh, in the, 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 the main uh, rules of, uh, of data protection. And you can ask, I can, and you can say, okay, I consent or not. I think everyone has uh, uh, this uh, this experience in uh, in uh, in this in uh, in your life. Uh, in, in addition, uh, GDPR um, says very clearly what are the basis for processing personal data. Um, there are six ways. The first one is consent, of course. But uh, someone can uh, can uh, process our data by a contractual obligation or legal obligation, or for vital interest. For example, if uh, um, if if you are in an hospital and uh, no one asks you, oh, can I save your life? Save your life? Can you tell me uh, what is your your blood, uh, what kind of blood you have, uh, this is a very personal data, okay? But no one asks you, can I use this, this, da this data? Of course. Then we have uh, the legitimate interest and uh, um, public interest or exercise of public authority. As you can see, I, I try to point out uh, um, the two uh, legal bases uh, um, you can use. First one is consent is very, very simple. But the, the most important, in my opinion, is the legitimate interest. The second one allows you to uh, post photos, videos, and some, something else on your website or on uh, um, social media because of the interest the park has in documenting activities. So we can say, Okay, my this park uh, is very interested in uh, uh, share this uh, this video of uh, this festival because we need to make uh, pu pu to, to give more visibility to our work. This is a legal interest, is a legitimate interest in GDPR. So we can use this uh, and it. Uh, in this case, uh, we don't need consent, okay? We can do it. Of course, this applies uh, uh, to everyone and to any initiative, but uh, today uh, I want to focus on the target audience, uh, that's young people. So what about young people? Uh, once again, I, I um, start from, from rules and, uh, and then tips and tricks, uh, and uh, I want to share a common language. First of all, GDPR is, uh, places a clear age limit on children under 16 years because they are considered minors and they can't give consent to their data processing. What does it mean? Uh, the most important thing is where the child is below si uh, 16 years old, such processing, the processing of, uh, of the his or her data, uh, personal data, should be uh, lawful only if consent is given by the holder of parental responsibility over the child, okay? But, of course, there is always a but in our life. Uh, 
In the same article, GDPR says that member states may provide by law for a lower age for those purposes, but only if the lower age is not below 13 years. So we can have in Europe or in, in, in other countries that use in, in, in such a way GDPR, uh, different ages, always between 13 and 16 years. Uh, in Italy, for example, it's 14 years. Uh, it's, it's very clear, uh, it's, uh, it's possible that in your country uh, you have a lower age. It's very easy to check it uh, even uh, with Google, uh, simply with, with Google. I, I think this. Uh, if you want to be very safe, use 16 years. Not a problem. Is the European law okay? It's, it's okay for everyone. Uh, you can also um, uh, you can also remind that uh, you can have in your country uh, something else. For, in, uh, I try to, to 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 make an example. In Italy, uh, for privacy to, to to privacy. Um, we can you we can't uh, uh, we can uh, sorry we can't ask a consent if uh, uh, the child is under fourteen yes but uh, for another law a child is uh, uh, legally um, legally uh, how can I say can can uh, can can sign a contract, for example, only over eighteen years. So, uh, I I worked uh, in, for a UNICEF uh, national uh, committee, and in UNICEF, they uh, decide to uh, use eighteen years, like a. Uh, age limit, even if the law uh, say, okay, 14 years old, it's a good, uh, good, uh, the, the right age, okay, is a, a, a very, uh, how can I say, uh, personal uh, way, my opinion is uh, 16 years uh, make you really, really safe in uh, uh, in using uh, this uh, in in, in uh, processing personal data uh, of a, of a child. Uh, so to to go to to focus on on, uh, on this. I try to imagine uh, some uh, typical situation related uh, to the programs uh, you with the young people, with the young people, especially with kids, of course, because uh, generally speaking, young people over 16 years or, or the age in uh, defined in, in your country is considered as an adult. First, I, I thought uh, to programs are with the schools or similar. Uh, then uh, uh, initiatives uh, um, like uh, family workshops or, or visits uh, aimed uh, at families. And uh, at the end, uh, um, those, all those even, events uh, that uh, such, such open days or such festival uh, in which participation is free and open to all. Uh, of course, you can have uh, a lot of initiatives, but mm, anyway, I, I, I think they may be similar 
uh, to those I consider. Of course, if you have uh, other, other initiatives or do you want uh, to know something uh, other, you can ask, you have to ask. So let's start with the programs uh, uh, in partnership with the schools. Uh, I, I'm sure you know that usually uh, at the beginning of the, school, of the school year, schools uh, ask parents uh, to sign a consent uh, that covers internal and external activities. You can ask uh, to read uh, the information that schools uh, give to parents because you have to be sure, this is very important, the consent covers sharing photos and videos on social media of school partners. You can say, uh, just an example, uh, you can find uh, some, some, a paragraph like, like, just like this. The school shall be able to transfer or to confer the data as defined above to partner organization etc. It's just an example. Eh? Uh, otherwise, if you don't, uh, um, if you don't know, if, if you don't try, uh, if you don't find something similar, you can use a specific uh, information and ask your school to contact uh, to collect uh, parents, uh, <coughs> sorry, consent. Uh, the second uh, the second uh, kind of initiatives are uh, all those uh, events uh, by reservation that involve families, family workshop and visits, etc. But uh, here, before you begin, uh, you can prepare a registration form with a request of consent for consent to be signed by parents. Of course, if you use an online booking, an online booking form, you can uh, also um, uh, put the, uh, the consent request uh, with, the personal, uh, with the personal data processing information in the form. Okay, here you can find uh, another example of information uh, that are Mm, that are compliant with, uh, with GPR. It's not important to read uh, it uh, now, but uh, you can, of course, read it with uh, um, more, um, more time uh, in, in, your, uh, in your office. Finally, uh, In, in our mind, the biggest problem mm, seems to be uh, initiatives uh, open to all, in which uh, we can't uh, know in, um, in, adv in advance how many and, and, and uh, which people will participate. But uh, uh, this made the easiest situation because you can simply use signs that inform that pictures or videos will be taken. You just must inform people, just um, saying something this way. The public is advised that uh, as part uh, of um, the, uh, of this event, uh, video or photographic images sounds, uh, um, oh, sorry, can, okay, are collected to, do, to document the event. Of course, uh, you uh, have to be sure that uh, uh, these, uh, these signs are placed in a very accessible location. And uh, uh, and everything, every everyone can can uh, see them. In any case, in my opinion, it's also a good idea um, to have some informational documents uh, with uh, on the processing of personal data, including a request of uh, 
consent for the use of the images. Normally people don't ask for it. Normally people really don't ask, but never say never. Sometimes we can use, when I go <laughs> to an open, <laughs> to an open um, day, sometimes I look for it, not, not always, but uh, yeah, it's, it's, my, it's my job. So I'm quite um, boring with other people. Um, remember, all you well, the always to remember that if you don't want uh, to worry about anything, you can always post photos and videos in which people are filmed from behind. Uh, it could be very, it, it seems like a stupid uh, yeah, idea, but, but it's so simple and, uh, uh, and you can live uh, safely <laughs> without problems. Of course, uh, I, I think it's uh, mm, just, uh, mm, it's, it's very important to, to, to show a, a smile uh, on, the on, a, on, on uh, the face of, uh, of a child, uh, but if there are problems, you must remember this. Just take a photo from behind and you can post it everywhere, every time. Thank you very much. That was really useful, Ilaria. Um, Ilaria has got many years of experience in this. Uh, I ap apologize, I forgot to explain in the beginning how she worked for UNICEF and helped translate the GDPR into um, the Italian system as well um, and have that um, yeah, implemented in, in UNICEF as well. So she has lots of experience with GDPR in general. If you have any questions um, or have any concerns, do let me know and I can put you in touch with her um, for the future as well. Thank yes, you so I, much. I, if I can just uh, can, yes. I can Go ahead. say something else. Uh, is If you don't have a um, question in this, uh, in this moment, uh, don't worry, you can, I think, you can uh, write uh, them to Jessica and Jessica can, uh, can, can uh, send them uh, to me by, ma by email and uh, I, um, I got my answer someday, okay? Thank you very much. That's a very kind, kind offer from your, on your behalf, Ilaria. Um, yeah, so this question of data protection came up um, from my side, as many of you already know that I manage the social media pages for the Europark uh, Junior Ranger and Youth Plus programs, and I love to share content of what you are all doing out there. In many cases, it's very easy. You all have your own Facebook pages, etc., and I just um, share directly from your pages. However, I do occasionally get requests requests to post pictures and the email and the mess um, and the photos are sent to me directly and this is where I really like Ilaria's suggestion of when you work with schools and you have a clause in there that says that they are allowed to share that information with additional parties for legitimate interests or to possibly have in your um, junior ranger programs a statement that says that you are able to show um, to share pictures with the Europark Federation who runs the junior ranger or not runs coordinates the international junior ranger program in Europe then that would just uh, be able to cover Europark as well then I can without any worry share those pictures but without that if it says you will not share it with third parties, that counts as Europark, even though many of your protected areas are members of Europark. So from my side, that's a really important uh, bit of information that I would love um, to be included in any consent folders. I also found it really interesting, the question of age. Thank you so much, Ilaria, for sharing that. Um, it's information that I didn't know before. Uh, my background isn't, my educational background is not in youth work. And I um, really appreciate knowing 
information like that. Does anyone have any questions? We'd love to open the floor. Um, does anyone just want to share their experience or share additional information that they think would be useful uh, on the topic of data protection and consent forms and so forth? Do feel free to raise your hand to write a question in the chat um, and we can give you the floor. I see there's one question in the chat. Thank you. The question is, um, hi, Ilaria. I was just wondering if the rules are different when concerning vulnerable persons or if these are the same as minors. Ilaria, over to you. So uh, I... I... Do you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. Yes. We um, hear you. I wish to to read the, the the question if I if I can. Yes. Because is see easier to me, or or can you uh, read again? Uh, yes. Yeah. So the question is: Are the rules different or the same between vulnerable persons and those who are the same and minors? Uh, so people in vulnerable situations that could be, maybe you could give some examples. I'm not so familiar, but I would assume people who okay. have been um, like perhaps okay. refugees. <laughs> I'm uh, not so sure. Okay. Mm, yeah, there are the same rules. Um, but uh, of course, uh, it, uh, well, uh, vulnerable people. If we if we talk about refugees, for example, uh, there are the same rules. So, sixteen years is the age, uh, the consent, etc. Uh, if we if we talk about uh, uh, vulnerable people, like um, like um, people with uh, with uh, yeah disabled. Or, or something similar, uh, you have also to collect consent from, uh, from uh, parents or, or uh, uh, from, um, yeah, from, from people uh, who has the responsibility of, this, of the, these people. And there are no age limits. So if you, if you, I worked, uh, with uh, um, with people with uh, Down syndrome, and uh, if uh, he he or she has uh, five, twenty, or sixteen years, it's the same. You must have the consent of uh, of people with the responsibility on these people. Okay. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for the question. I think it definitely. Um, helps us to keep that in mind. And if you would like to share what sorts of vulnerable people that you work with, that can also help um, the community. And I can read that out at a later point. Are there any additional questions? If not, then I would love to move on to our second speaker for today. Thank you very much, Ilaria. And I hope um, any additional questions that I will get will be forwarded to you. And uh, thank you so much for, uh, for supporting um, our community. So our next speaker is Lou Willis-Keeler. She is a specialist in safeguarding. She advises some of our members in the UK. Um, and she has come here today to share her knowledge on safeguarding and creating safe spaces for all. So over to you, Lou. Thank you very much and um, thank you very much for inviting me to attend this afternoon. I hope that you will find it useful, uh, in particular building upon Ilaria's points as well, which I might be able to answer as I go through uh, today's PowerPoint and session. It's just a short session and there's a bit of an assumption that hopefully in your role working with young people, you have all had some level of experience around safeguarding training. Uh, my background is for the past 20 years, I've been working for a variety of different sectors in the UK and internationally. I worked in America uh, for a number of years as well around youth work and in particular specialising in safeguarding young people 
those who are at risk and are vulnerable and accessing many services as well. So I've worked with a lot of organisations across the UK as well to look at what is best practice and looked at not only in a real world context of how we keep young people safe, but also a digital safeguarding context as well. So this, for this short session, what I wanted to do was just have a little bit of time with you to talk and explore the concept of how do we create safe spaces with those young people that we're working with? What does that actually mean when we talk about safe spaces? How do we create one? Um, how do we maintain it? And what are some of the factors that we need to consider about how it might impact those that we're working with, ourselves, the environment, and how that can impact the um, level of work that we're doing with young people as well. So it might impact their engagement and their experience of engaging in our programmes as well. Um, hopefully from today's session as well, you'll be able to jot lots of notes down. And it will give you some ideas to take away about how you might be able to expand your own toolkit and develop a range of strategies and tools for overcoming any challenges in a safeguarding context as well. So, right. So what is a safe space? It's a term that is heavily used in the UK. I'm not sure if you use it a lot in your practice. But we need to be thinking about how do we actually create safe spaces for those young people that we're engaging with, whether it be in person or in a digital context as well. One of the important things in terms of safeguarding is how do we simplify terminology in a way that everybody, including those children and young people we work with, has a clear understanding of what it is we mean and what we're trying to achieve. So I thought I'd bring up a little bit of a definition for you to read on the screen. And you might be thinking about how do you actually set the scene with those young people that you're working with to help them feel safe? We know that if young people feel safe, they will get the most from an educational experience and they're more likely to build lasting relationships with those as workers and our organisations as well. So I've put up on the screen a very basic definition of what a safe space is. And again, it's really important to assume that individuals might not mean, might not know what we mean when we talk about safe spaces. So every opportunity, we should be looking for how we can clarify and check the le level of understanding with those young people that we're working with. So if we were to break this definition down into key points, a safe space is a place or an environment. And again, I've mentioned, we look at the real world environment, but many people post the pandemic are also still engaging with young people in a digital context. And there can be a bit of a perception that we've got the real world environment and we've got digital environments and that they're very different between the two. Actually, if we think about the work that we do with young people in the digital environment, they're engaging in that environment, but they're still engaging in a real world environment as well. So we need to think about what some of the risks and factors that might impact that feeling of safety a young person has. And we also need to recognise ourselves within this as well. If we were to think back about what is safeguarding, it is what we call an umbrella term that encompasses a lot of elements but it's often perceived that it's something we do to other people. Actually, it's something we do in partnership with others, but we are central to that as well. So we have to think about our own personal feelings of safety when we're working with young people, whether that be in a real world environment or a digital environment as well. And we have to be confident that we take reasonable steps and measures to ensure that everybody feels confident that engaging with us and the work that we do, they are being exposed to an environment that will limit harm to them and that therefore we will consider everything we possibly can to ensure that safe space is free from discrimination, criticism, harassment or any emotional or physical harm as well. The strong emphasis upon that definition is how do we know that others feel confident? What is it that actually tells us that person might be feeling confident? Well, the key part of this is, how do we keep young people and children's voices central to the work that we do, that they feel confident and safe to express to us 
when there might be things happening that jeopardise that feeling of safety as well. So one of the ways that we start to identify and measure, how do we know if we've actually created a safe space? Well, there's key elements within that. And the first thing is, you may have heard of this term as well in your work, is around the do no harm principle. When we're working with young people in whatever environment, we must be open to the thought that we could be potentially causing harm. Even though it might not be our intention, inadvertently, some of the actions that we take might cause harm to a young person. And we're not just looking at physical harm, we're looking at emotional harm as well. So we have to be meticulous and plan and think ahead of what is it we actually could be doing to cause harm and how could we reduce the likelihood of that occurring. We need to generate in the work that we're doing a speak up and a speak out culture where everybody feels comfortable and able to speak out if they've got any concerns and they know exactly what will happen if they do speak out and how they will be supported. We need to think the unthinkable and that means that in the way that we work with young people, many who might be vulnerable or at risk, we might be working with fellow colleagues or professionals or other agencies, we need to think the unthinkable and think that potentially harm could come from ourselves or those that we're working with in partnership to work with children and young people as well. So we have to create a culture of vigilance and openness where we think about the harm that could occur and it might not just be the focus upon harm that's occurring externally to those children and young people in the home environments and the communities that they're engaged in, but what harm they might come into contact when they're working with us. And with thinking of the unthinkable, we also have to think of children and young people might be causing harm to one another as well. We need to improve engagement and make sure that we've got policies and procedures in place that clearly outline the steps and processes we need to take in order to prevent harm to detect harm and take appropriate action to protect, protect everybody from harm as well. That goes hand in hand with a risk assessment. If we think back to our safeguarding training, um, we like to keep safeguarding as simple as possible. We know in doing so, it's more likely that people will understand what we're trying to achieve. They will um, engage more openly in the process they'll be part of the solution, not the problem. And we'll all work together collectively to ensure that safeguarding is everybody's responsibility and we take action. So the simplest way we break that down in terms of thinking about a safeguarding response is we have what is called the three safeguarding R's. As you can see on the screen, are we recognizing, are we responding appropriately and are we referring that information? So if we were to dig a little bit deeper in terms of what those three R's are, is the first one is around risk. What are the associated risks uh, in terms of the environments that we're working with young people? How are we engaging with them? How are we identifying those risks? And how do we categorize them as well? So it was interesting just to build upon the last point around photos. And if we were to take photos as an example, we need to sit down and think about what are the risks of us publishing images of children and young people online and in some of our publicity material. So whilst from a legal perspective, we may have consent and it may be deemed appropriate, we need to be mindful of what those risks are and to unpick them to think about what strategies can we put in place and enable an effective response. So part of that might be liaising with parents and carers to identify is there any reason, although we might be able to gain consent, is there any reason that we know we might be putting a child or a young person at risk by putting their image online? They might be vulnerable or at risk. For example, you might be working with children and young people that are in the care system, and therefore it would actually increase their level of risk for their personal circumstances if those images are shared. So it's all about how do we fact find and find out a little bit more information about personal circumstances and ensure that we're reminded of that do no harm principle. We need to identify clearly our priorities, i.e. how do we identify those risks? How do we categorize those risks? How are we being proactive and able to react accordingly as well? We should do as much work as possible in advance to identify those risks 
but have what we call a dynamic risk assessment. It's not until we get working with children and young people and we understand the dynamic of that, that we understand those individual young people will bring their own sets of risks and challenges as well. And we need to be able to respond to that and make sure we're taking appropriate action as well. We have to have a culture of vigilance and that can be a bit of a challenge as well. So we must be alert to what the potential risks and hazards are and we must ensure that we don't become complacent. And that can be a bit of a challenge for practitioners doing very similar programs over and over again. So it's really important that we are aware of, of what those challenges are and how we overcome them. In our response, which is our second area, we need to be mindful of the do no harm principle. And often that can come through inappropriate um, reaction to when can safeguard and concerns are brought to light. So we making sure that we're all trained and everybody that's working with people are appropriately trained to know how to re um, respond accordingly to ensure that that best help and support is available for children and young people. That will link to our policies and procedures that should clearly outline what we should be doing in what circumstances. And recognising that we're all human and we all have our own issues going on and we all might be feeling vulnerable at different times as well. So how do we practice self-care and ensure that we are looking after ourselves when looking after others? We also need to recognise that when we do respond to something, we might need to pass information on and it needs to be done in a timely manner. Time um, is of the essence to make sure the most appropriate support is put in place for an individual and that therefore that links back to our policies and procedures that should clearly guide what is the time frame for us to respond to any concerns and who we need to speak to. So we have to refer the information in line with our policies and procedures, but we also may, may need to refer the young people to other support services that are part of that wider network and wider support system that they should have in place as well. So it's constantly thinking about what are the risks? How do we categorize them? How do we identify them? And as part of that effective risk assessment system, we should be building relationships with young people and enable them to feed into this. Um, we're wanting to connect with young people, create that safe space so young people themselves can identify the risk and be part of the solution in terms of what mitigating and protective factors we can put in place to ensure that we are creating safe spaces for those young people that we work with as well. So if we put it into a digital context, if you're working with young people in a digital context, we categorise risk into three main categories. And this is called the three C's of digital safeguarding. So we've got the three R's of safeguarding, which will be applicable in any environment you're working with. But specifically, we need to think about a digital context. And the first one is content. So as previously mentioned, what is the information, images, sound, etc., that can be broadcast that can cause harm? So it might be what are you putting out on your social media channel, channels when you're advertising the work that you do? And it is really important that you do use content. And we know that photos and videos are very effective at telling a story and helping us raise the profile of the work that we do. But how do we ensure that that content is appropriate so we're not actually going to cause harm? So we need to approach this very sensitively with children and young people and ask their voices. So just to reiterate the point is, yes, we can get legal consent, but how do young people feel about us taking those photos? Do young people know where we're going to put those photos and what we're going to do with them? And are they aware fully of the impact of what, we're, what would happen if we're sharing those images and they weren't confident as well? So we need to be thinking of what content we're putting out there what access to opportunity other people have to broadcast content and information and how that might cause harm. The second C is around contact. Um, does your policy and procedure outline what is and isn't appropriate contact? So what are the platforms that people are, engage, are able, enabled to engage with young people? Um, what is a reasonable amount of contact? Is it that there is clear stipulation in your policies and procedures about whether you can contact or interact with social media platforms in a personal context, or is it all through your professional site as well? And what is deemed as inappropriate contact? And if somebody feels that there's inappropriate contact, does everybody know what action they can do to take, um, to take action to prevent that from occurring and who they can speak out to as well? And conduct the final say, 
Um, what is the code of conduct for all parties involved? So not just staff and volunteers that are involved in your project, but those young people that you're working with as well. Do they have a clear age appropriate understanding of what is appropriate conduct? So do you, as part of your work, set a context of how you can actually create that safe space by ensuring everybody understands what is and isn't appropriate behaviour as well. Okay. Building upon that, another three C's of digital safeguarding and how we actually build those safe spaces is we need to think about it in the most simplest forms is how do we create that safe space to enable everybody to understand what it is, what we're trying to achieve, and how do we therefore connect with those individuals within that safe space? So if we're wanting to maximise the impact of the work that we're doing, creating a safe space will enable a more effective outcome. Um, we're more likely to increase the value and level of impact and ensure that people leave our uh, services or our programmes feeling more engaged, safe, having an overall enjoyable experience. But we need to be able to connect with those individuals and form meaningful relationships in the environments that we're working to really emphasise that speak out culture and to understand the motivation of why people are coming and working with us, what they're trying to get from engaging with us as well. So we need to think about looking at activities that quite quickly help you set the scene so people feel safe. They know what is expected of them and what they can expect of you. And to demonstrate a deeper connection in terms of understanding how you can build a relationship in that safe space because the final C is around communication. And we know that if young people feel safe in the environments we're providing and they feel connected to us, we're gonna have a greater impact in terms of the communication and uh, the level of work that we're doing with that young person and how it becomes meaningful and they are more engaged in the process. So we need to consider what are the different elements of our communication and how we keep it um, relevant to them as well. So creating the environment, it's all about our values and attitudes. It's making sure that we're mindful of how that informs our behaviours. We must be dynamic and enable appropriate responses to the circumstances that kind of come up. Uh, that feeling of safety and that safe space is not fixed. It must be continually worked on. And we must not assume that everybody feels safe in that space. So we have to have that mechanism, of people clearly knowing how to speak up. We must actively promote a speak up and speak out culture and people know how to raise concerns with you and know what the response would be if they need to um, get additional support. We should provide information, support and guidance and signposting to other services and support mechanisms if required. And we must ensure that we have fit for purpose policies and procedures that clearly outline action to be taken. And that will inform appropriate behaviour also training and supervision needs of anybody working with young people. When we're connecting, we know that um, relationships are deeper if people uh, feel safer. So that's why it's really important we have clear professional boundaries and we identify that it is a professional relationships. Um, relationships are absolute key in effectively um, engaging young people. The stronger our relationship, the stronger the impact and the influence that our work will have upon that individual as well. It's quite an interesting concept from anybody that might be aware of uh, Dr. William Glasser, who was the author of Choice Theory, and he really emphasised the um, importance of the relationship and the strength of that relationship and the environments we build will increase the level of influence that we have as well. And finally, in terms of um, how do we actually communicate with young people, um, we need to recognise that there's a wide range of communication needs um, and we must promote um, accessibility and inclusion. So ensuring that we are being encompassing in our practice and modelling the behaviours we want to see. So how are we communicating non-verbally, but how are we making sure the language that we're using is fit for purpose and appropriate. So it's not too complex, it's not too filled with jargon and there's not too much information. So it's really important to keep your information short and simple and to the point and make sure that we're engaging with young people to test their level of knowledge and understanding and not assume that just because we've talked about it, a young person understands it. Making sure that our content is appropriate 
um, age appropriate, but also very sensitively delivered as well to make sure we're not going to cause any further harm. So we need to be mindful of the uh, images and sounds that we're broadcasting and the information, terminology and language and really taking that time to step out and think about what is it I'm doing right now could be potentially causing harm to somebody and how might I overcome that as well. We must ensure that we have key, key, clear, sorry, when I can speak, clear boundaries on ways to communicate, such as the platforms we're going to use, the frequency and timings. So it comes back to conduct and contact. So we've got those three C's making uh, emergence there in terms of content, conduct and contact, a three C's that we should be considering when we're working digitally uh, with young people to create a safe space. OK. So thank you very much for listening. Um, I hope that that has been useful. I know that there's quite a lot of information come out in a very short amount of time. Um, I'm hoping that you might revisit this recording and go back and take some points away from it as well. But if you'd like to keep in contact with me after today's session, feel free to do so. I'm on LinkedIn. Um, I always love to hear from people. My email address is on there as well. And um, follow me on Twitter as well. So any questions? Thank you very much, Lou. Sure, that was very interesting. Um, lots of new information for my brain and um, <laughs> also really nice to hear it at a higher level. I can definitely relate to some experiences I have and now I can identify them in a in a nice framework. So that's really, I'm really, really grateful for you to take your time to come here and share with us. If anybody has questions, once again, uh, feel free to raise your hand or to write the question in the chat. If you'd like any more clarifications or if you have any questions to specific uh, circumstances, feel free to share them. I um, have one for you, Lou, in the meantime. Yeah. And this is maybe a very basic question, but I'm thinking about young people that we work with that might like to start their own youth groups, and it would be useful for us to maybe share this information. But what are some examples of appropriate policies and procedures that we can, um, that we should have set up, um, and something that we can guide a youth group towards researching if they would like to set something up like that? Yeah, we, the Keep things simple. Um, and I sometimes see organizations feel overwhelmed around safeguarding, and that's natural. But it's really important that we start off with a solid foundation and we can create a, a basic safeguarding policy. Um, and, and I would explain to those young people and get them to be part of the solution in terms of thinking, what are some of the things that they're concerned might harm somebody? Um, and if so, what can they do to stop that? And it's about them understanding that ultimately they have the right to not be hurt, the right to get help and the right to be listened to as well. So we want a, a proactive policy that basically says, what's our commitment, everybody, to looking after ourselves and one another? How are we going to do that? What does that look like? What are some of the things we're going to say we're not going to do? So we're not going to bully, we're not going to shout over each other, we're not going to hit each other and break it down in language really simply that they understand the behaviours that they understand. And then say, actually, if something does happen and somebody might be feeling worried or frightened or might be being hurt, what can we actually do about it so that there's a clear process for them to do that? And um, if you're thinking about getting young people to do that, what I'd encourage them to do is do something really visual. Um, we don't want big wordy documents with lots of words because chances are people won't engage with that and they won't remember it. So you can kind of storyboard it in terms of this is the things that we're going to do and we're not going to do. And if somebody's feeling this, this is the steps that they can do as well. So that basic safeguarding policy should be, what are we going to do to stop harm? What are we going to do if it occurs? who we're going to speak to and what support can we kind of get in place as well. And that links back to ground rules and the work that you should be doing with young people to create that safe space as well. So, you know, what's our commitment to behaviour? And we've all got that responsibility. So what are we all going to do? Yeah. 
Thank you very much. I still don't see any questions in the chat. Uh, feel free to to take the floor. Otherwise, I will ask another question. But this is um, yes, just so that that you can all have some time to ask to to write some questions in the chat. My next question is about risks risk assessments specifically. Um, I personally have done more in the physical risks. Um, but could you maybe name some sort of emotional or mental risks uh, that should be included in a risk assessment for young people? Yeah, so if we think back to those three C's, which are the content, contact and conduct, is in terms of the emotional, we need to think about um, that do no harm principle that I've mentioned as well. So. Um, we need to ensure that we're identifying that we're not going to put young people in a circumstance that they might be emotionally upset or challenged about that it can be detrimental and this is where as a risk assessment we really need to consider from an educational point of view is we know that there's value in terms of encourage people out of their comfort zone into their stretch zone we don't want to put them in the panic zone so we need to think about and recognise the uniqueness of the individual within that as well. So what I mean by that is what might put me in my panic zone, Jessica, you, it might not even bother you. It might just be slightly in your stretch. So, again, we have to recognise that somebody's an individual and it's also fluid. So it never stays fixed. So I might be one day absolutely fine to go out and you've asked me to speak about your project and I'm fine to do that one day. The next day, I might just be feeling a little bit emotionally vulnerable and I might just feel a little bit out of, of whack and been asked to do that, I might then start to get a little bit stressed about speaking out in front of people as well. And then that can increase my social anxiety. So we need to think about, you know, um, the context that we're asking young people to be in. How do we check in and make sure that support system's there as well? Are we doing practical steps of making sure people aren't being isolated? Or we're not using language that would isolate them or using language that they would feel they can't relate to or is scary or overpowering as well. So emotional, we need to think about what are the potential emotional signs. So it could be they feel victimised, isolated, embarrassed, shamed, um, that they've been socially excluded, for example, and kind of thinking about those specific environments that were in there as well. In terms of emotional, uh, sorry, mental, we do know that many mental health problems with early help and early intervention can be prevented or limited. And that's why it's again comes back to that message of a speak out culture as well. Our role is not to diagnose people, young people in those conditions, but it's there to create that safe space to enable them to speak out and get the support that they actually need as well. So I hope that answers your question without giving you a get a big comprehensive list. I think that was great. Thank you very much. I'm sure it will be useful to many people listening here in uh, here today and also many that will go and watch the recording. Um, we know that lots of people can't uh, attend during working hours and we'll watch it afterwards. So I'm, I'm also asking on, on their behalf. But if anybody does have questions, do share them in the chat. I think for now, thank you, Lou. Uh, we would like to go on to our third speaker. We have uh, Francisca Maas from IVN, uh, Nature Education in the Netherlands. And um, IVN runs all the junior ranger programs in the Netherlands when all the seven different national parks that they have there. Um, and they work a lot with young people. And today we have their communications expert, Francisca, who will be just sharing a couple of basic things that um, she's learned over her time uh, working with communication and young people and sharing their work. So over to you, Francisca. Yes, thank you so much, Jessica. Hello, everyone. Um, welcome. I am going to share a little bit about the communication perspective and how to increase and improve your visibility of all of your youth projects. Um, so as Jessica already mentioned, my name is Francisca. Uh, I'm very passionate about communication. Uh, you can see me here in the vegetable garden and on a summer camp in Italy with young people. And the reason that I'm so passionate about communication around this topic is because I see in myself, but also around me, that a lot of young people are looking for a way to contribute to a more sustainable world, but they don't always know where to go. They don't always know where to find these places. 
And we did a bit of a survey in one of our provinces here in the Netherlands. And it turned out that like a large majority, like around 90% of the people that we interviewed were really interested in our projects and 60% uh, even wanted to like actively contribute to them. But um, only 6%, so only a very small amount of them actually knew us uh, before we mentioned, before we uh, spoke to them about it. So I think that very clearly demonstrates that, um, yeah, there's a lot of people who want to do something, but they just don't always know where to find us. Um, so it's great that you guys are working with all these projects. And I hope that today I can share you a little bit more about how to make them more uh, visible. So I've been working at EVN uh, Materia de Gazi for one and a half years, and I've learned some small things here and there that I think could be valuable. Um, and I think uh, communication is not just about um, you know, reaching out to people, but also uh, settling some, some type of connection with them uh, and maintaining a relationship. Um, you can inform people, you can also inspire them, but you also, of course, want to activate them to do something. And there are many forms in which communication can take place. And I think we already heard that from the previous speakers as well. You can have it face-to-face, uh, -face, but also online is a big world, of course. And you can have a sort of one-sided uh, communication, but also more interactive. Um, so it's a big topic, um, and today I'm not going to share any ready to implement solutions, but I do hope I can uh, pose you some like questions and things to think about and to consider and to um, yeah to work with. So one of the most important things that I've learned so far uh, on my way is that it's very important to think like your target group. So of course we tend to think and communicate from our own perspective, like that's very natural. Uh, and I also have to keep reminding myself to really think like the target group. Okay, who are they? Where are they? And what do they wanna hear? What motivates them? Um, so considering all those aspects um, currently within our organization, the ways that we reach out to young people are the following. So one of the most effective things that I've learned is that the uh, network of young people that you already have within your uh, organization is also the best way to reach new young people. So really invest in them and try to uh, activate them to share about what they're doing with your projects and to invite other people in their environment to also tag along. So that could mean that, uh, for instance, we have a lot of WhatsApp groups in which we post a uh, little, uh, how do you say, like invitations for people to uh, join events or join a certain projects. And then we ask them to share that within their network. Uh, so that's one of the communication channels that we often use. And, that I found to be one of the most effective ones, actually. But we also have a newsletter, um, which to me, uh, I'm 25 years old. It still it feels a little bit uh, old fashioned to have a newsletter because I'm, I'm all over the social media um, places. But actually I've learned that it is a very nice and stable place uh, to directly connect with your uh, network that, are, that is already familiar with you. Uh, so again, that is a very valuable communication channel for us. Uh, we also, of course, have our website, and I will show you a little bit about that later. Um, and uh, for the social media platforms, uh, we use LinkedIn at the moment because that's kind of what fits our messaging and uh, the type of uh, content that, content that, you want, that we want to put out. And as Jessica mentioned, we uh, do some work around the communication with the um, uh, junior rangers and the youth plusers, but we also have many, many other uh, young uh, yeah, projects geared towards uh, young people. Um, so that's why maybe you think like, oh, LinkedIn is maybe not the place for a junior ranger to go to, but it's, it's yeah, we, we have a bit of a broader, uh, how do you say, uh, broader view of young people. Um, let me see. Yeah, so uh, these are just a couple of ways to communicate with young people. And of course, there are many, many other places and many opportunities that we also haven't used yet. For instance, uh, you can reach out to young people through schools, through their family, through uh, work or uh, other type of media or other communities. And I was actually quite interested. Um, so I want to ask you all a question and you can respond in the chat. What is a sphere or like where do you reach out to uh, the young people? Is that through media, like your website or your social media platform? Is that through schools which you have connections with or um, through other organizations? Um, just to get a bit of a feeling for where you are currently at with your communication. So if you could put that in a chat, that would be great. Then I have a bit of a bit of a view. 
And in the meantime, I will continue and you can think about it. Or is there already something in the chats? Their own trusted networks, youth clubs, yes, so communities, partner organizations, schools, um, social media. Okay, so that's it's very diverse. That's great. That's good to hear. Thank you so much all for sharing. Um, I'm sure you can also share your wisdom among among each other. Um, Okay, yeah, so there are many, many different spheres uh, or many different communication channels. And I'd like to show an example of the ones that we have. Oops, where is this slide? Yes. So on the left, you see our newsletter. On the right are some screenshots from our website. And what I'd like to highlight is that when you have the newsletter, uh, I like to make things very visual, uh, personalized, but also, um, well, it is all in Dutch. So I'm sorry, this might be a bit confusing to, <laughs> to read. But on the left, we talk about the um, elections that we have going on right now, and we try to offer them a bit of support, like how can you vote more uh, towards uh, nature and nature protection. Uh, so um, you'll also want to get them involved in the, how do you say, like recent events. And on the right, on the website, uh, a recent change that we made is that first we had a website that was uh, showing all of our themes in which we do different projects. And now we made it um, more geared towards who is who's on that website. So we have the different target groups. So for instance, here you see young Volsene, which means young adults. Um, but we also have um, uh, school, like if you're a teacher or if you are a um, someone working at an organization or if you are um, a volunteer in an organization. So it's more gear, geared towards who are you and what do you need to find on the website? And I think that already gives a lot of clarity. Um, and then also in this text, I'm using a, a couple of keywords that are linked to different motivations. So for instance, SAMA means together. Um, do you, and uh, I'm also, there's also something about like, oh, are you looking for a way to contribute to a sustainable world? Do you want to do something uh, nearby? And those are all ways of different message framing. And I think that could also be very helpful in a communication and increasing your visibility. If you really connect with what is motivating your target audience. So I also wanted to talk a little bit about that. And this type of message framing depends on what you mean by when you talk about young people, because um, when I talk about young people, I usually talk about 18 to 13 years old, where someone else might think like, oh no, I, I mean 12 to 18. And uh, yeah, it's a very large period of time actually when we say young people. And it's also a period of time with a lot of transitioning. So depending on where you are in that, um, yeah, in that period, different type of messages may be more interesting to you. So I want to give a couple of quick highlights. So for instance, when you are in your early adolescence, uh, 10 to 13 years old, you are very focused on group. Like you really want to be part of a group, you want to belong, and your self-image also comes from this group. And your world is quite uh, oriented around school. So this is like an influence sphere that you could use around uh, this, this group of young people. and. Um, yeah, something that's, of course, quite new is that they their online world is quite large. So even though their physical space, like they're very much in their own local area, uh, their online space is quite large. So that's interesting as well. Then you have the mid-adolescence, which is like 14 to 17 years old. And this is kind of when this individuation process starts. So when uh, they're still, of course, very much like centered on that group, but they're also trying to like they're finding out like their own individual Ness within that group. Um, so that's also something you can, you know, like keep in the back of your mind when you're writing a message towards this group. Then we have the uh, late adolescence, which is around 18 to 23 years old. And um, here you see that their self image is already made up more of their own character, their own choices, and a little less dependent on the group. Um, although they're still very much looking for like minded people, because of course, we're always gonna be happy in a group like that. Um, and they are also looking for a bit more exploration and um, they do still want to have the safety net. So they wanna explore, they wanna find out who am I, but they also still wanna feel that safe container to explore, uh, yeah, explore themselves within. Um, and lastly, we have emerging adolescence, which, which is until 30 years old. And here it's also a very self-focused exploration. Um, and also still looking for the like-minded community. 
And I think some general themes that we see all over uh, is that when you talk about your project or your uh, group, um, it's good to be very concrete. Like, what are you offering? Um, for example, we saw that if we communicated about our projects in general terms, like, oh, you can contribute to biodiversity like this, or you can help um, this become a more greener world, uh, that that was less, people were less responsive to that versus when you would say, oh, you can help build a food forest in this city, or you can help develop a school uh, class for this primary school in this area around this topic. So be concrete in your communication, be very clear about what you can get as a young person from that project. And I also noticed that the older they get, the more they look for also flexibility, which is not maybe, not that I think about it, a communication thing, more about like how you arrange your projects, but they, they also find flexibility very important. Um, and actually what is also super interesting uh, is that um, of course, these are some general guidelines, but in the end, the people they already work with know best. So ask the young people in your network, how did you find us? Uh, what motivated you to join us? Like that's the really valuable information that you can use for your own personal situ situation. Um, and it was also a good reminder for myself to do that again, because uh, yeah, it's really important to ask the people that you wanna write messages for, that you wanna reach, you have to ask them, what, what do they need? What do they want? And here's a little bit about storytelling because I am very passionate about storytelling. And I think as human beings, we love stories, we love to hear them. And when you communi communicate, it's also very important to not just share information, but also really connect uh, with each other from human to human. And stories are great for that. Um, so when you wanna reach people and you wanna activate them, uh, share the stories of the young people that you're working with, like what motivates them but also what are their struggles and what help them along the way to reach their goals, for instance. Uh, I think that can be very, uh, very motivating. Um, so here's like a little image. It's again in Dutch, it's from one of my colleagues. She drew this and it's about like, okay, what is like, what is someone longing for? And then they're like jumping in and then there's a struggle and then there's the climb where they get help from people and then they reach their destination. Like that's kind of like the whole tension storytelling um, yeah, a method. So that's something you can you can use, get in the back of your head when you uh, want to share a story from someone. Um, so I think authenticity and transparency is also very important. Um, so when you are sharing stories that, uh, yeah, you stay true to what you actually have to offer. I think speaking from personal experience, uh, when I first started, uh, there was this project that I was very enthusiastic about and I wrote a whole thing about it on our website. And then later on, we got feedback that the program wasn't really reflected in that description. So I, I kind of like, I was thinking so much about what do young people want that I was writing that instead of what do we actually have to offer. So I think it's very important to stay authentic and transparent because uh, also a lot of time young people can kind of see through uh, whether you're being truthful or not. And they kind of a good reader for that. Um, and that kind of ties in with my last thing that I'd like to share with you today. Uh, and that is about diversity and inclusivity because it's a very important topic. And um, I must say that within our organization, we have so many more steps to take, but I uh, wanted to already give you some basics that we are also trying to work on. So as you can see, there are a lot of photos here that I pulled from our uh, photo database. And um, when you use, uh, of course, so diversity means that there are different uh, characteristics in which you can describe someone and they can be visible or they can be not so visible, but things like a different background, different educational background, uh, different gender, um, uh, ethnicity. Uh, there are many, many um, yeah, diversity characteristics and inclusivity is, inclusivity is um, really giving the space for every, every person with the different characteristics to feel like they're being included and appreciated. And um, yeah, nowadays that's just a really important theme. And some small things that you can already think about now is the type of language that you use when you communicate. Or for instance, keep it very simple, very basic. Don't use too much of your own organizational uh, jargon or words that are from your, your field of expertise. And also in the imaging that you use, try to include uh, people from different, yeah, different backgrounds. And uh, we are not, we're not there yet. Uh, I'm also still very much learning. Uh, so you can see in these pictures, we try to do it diverse, like get females, males, uh, different 
uh, skin colors, uh, different, um, well, yeah, visibly, you can't even see that many diversity characteristics here in these photos. So again, with this, be, um, yeah, be transparent about where you are uh, with the diversity, um, but also uh, do try to make an effort to uh, show in your language and in your visuals that you uh, welcome uh, all, all people. Um, let me just check my notes. No, I think that was it, what I wanted to share about this. So lastly, my invitation to you all is um, to really, yeah, think about who is my target group and um, what motivates them and where can I reach them and how can I also make my communication inclusive. Uh, and I hope some of the things that I shared with you today will get you started. But like I mentioned, it's also super important to use your own network to research. So maybe you can set out a survey or a focus group and really to help answer these questions. And then hopefully you can um, design your communication channels accordingly and really get your message and get your project out there because I think that is really important to see uh, so the young people can find their place to contribute to your beautiful missions. So thank you so much. I will stop sharing my screen now and I will open the floor for questions. Let me see. I think there's some in the chats. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Francisco. That was really lovely um, of you to share and for, for those ideas on how to reflect on your own work and, and um, to do better. There was one very clear question in the chat, which was about your newsletter. Um, what platform do you use to send it out? Is it a general email or do you do it with some sort of a messenger application? Do share. Thanks. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, so we do use a platform. I think it's called like a CRM uh, platform. So that's for like customer relations, something, something. And it's called Procurios. Um, and it's so it's our database where we keep all of our information for all of our members and everything. And we can also make the newsletters and then um, send them to the different relations that we have within our database. Uh, so I think that's definitely very helpful. Um, it makes it look a bit more professional. And it's also just very handy to have the newsletter and a database in one place. Uh, and what was the other question? Which? That was it. Oh, that was it. OK. <laughs> yeah. So I think we've come a long way from the newsletters that used to be a PDF attached to an email. <laughs> and nowadays, uh, most people use some sort of a platform. Uh, there are a couple with uh, free versions like MailChimp, or right. we use GetResponse, but it, you draft the email in there and you send it out to the list that you of emails that you've stored. Um, yes, thank you very much. Um, I think there are some more questions in the chat. Uh, we still have three more minutes, so maybe I'll just take this last question and then I'll say thank you. So for the direct communication with WhatsApp groups, that sounds very interesting. Um, how did you start it and how do you promote it to get new contacts in it? That's a good question. So um, we have different colleagues who run the projects with the with the young people, and usually throughout or at the end, they will ask them, "Hey, would you like to be part of the of, of the WhatsApp group?" And they just add them. So it's also not one big WhatsApp group; like it's per region, per province. We have different WhatsApp groups, um, and I think it's just like you could also choose to have one big WhatsApp group if that works for your organization. And then I think it's important to communicate with your colleagues or the people that you work with, that they're all aware that this WhatsApp group is there and that every time they close off some kind of contact session with young people that you invite them to join the WhatsApp group. So you can also get new contacts in it. Uh, you could also ask the people who are already in the WhatsApp group to share the link uh, with people who think it could be interesting for as well. Uh, so that you really already make use of the network that is already there. I think those are just the two ways right now that I that I can think about. But if anyone has a better idea, please share. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'd love to just round this off uh, by bringing it back to Ilaria. 
um, when we were talking about data protection and WhatsApp groups, uh, it was really useful for you to share uh, the different age groups. So, for example, if you were to make a WhatsApp group with 16 years and older, their joining it would be consent enough because they can consent. But would their phone number then count as a identifier, an online identifier? And would you need consent then for them to join or is them taking the initiative to join the group themselves consent enough? Yeah, um, it's a good question, but the, if they uh, give you, uh, or better, if, if they um, join the group, is a, a, a proactive uh, action. So uh, you don't need consent. Okay, you just have to, to, to say, um, okay, uh, this is our WhatsApp group. If you want, uh, just uh, click uh, here and to, to, to collect. Okay, and it's, it's okay, it's all right. Thank you much. Thank you very much for clarifying that. Um, and thank you to all our lovely listeners for joining today. I hope the session was very useful. If you have any additional questions, you can write to me. Uh, we will also be sending out an email with the three presentations. So you'll be getting those and you can have some time to read through them or consult with them or share them with your colleagues um, as you wish so that we can make sure that we can work with young people in a way that's safe for everyone. I'd also love to say a very big thank you to our three speakers, uh, Lou and Ilaria. Neither of you were uh, directly part of the Europark family and you used your time to come and share with us and help us. So I'm really appreciative. Uh, Francisca, it was lovely to hear more about what IVN does. And I know you are really strong with the junior rangers and we're really grateful uh, for the work that you do in the Netherlands. Yes, so with that, I'd like to say a big thank you. There is also going to be a feedback form, um, which my colleague Sandra, who's been doing all the technical backup um, for me for this webinar, will share in the chat. Thank you very much, Sandra. And we'll also send the feedback form out by email. So if you have to run to your next meeting, which might be starting right now, uh, then uh, feel free to fill that out later. With that, I wish you all a wonderful evening or afternoon. <laughs> Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Ciao.